All right, good morning, guys. I don't want to interrupt. This is a lot like the chattiest I've ever seen you people. <laughs> it's like the masks are finally, well, they're still here, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry to interrupt, but we have some chemistry to do. Uh, we got a midterm coming up. And a couple of things about the midterm. I can confirm that it will be open book. Open book means it's not going to be harder. Open book means you can use any resource that's available on Acorn. You can use your textbook and you can use any personal notes that you've taken. What you cannot do is Google, uh, go to any third party website. You're not allowed to communicate with each other and you're not allowed to like post questions on forums or that kind of stuff, right? And um, I've seen many examples of that happen in the past where really bad information comes back. Um, so yeah, that's what's going to be available to you. On the other hand, like the uh, format of the midterm is going to be very similar to the first one where there's going to be the multiple choice section, which I think last time was 40%. I think that's probably going to be around the same this time. Um, a lot of those questions are already put together. Those will be like the last one where they'll be randomized and there'll be slightly different tests for each person. Some variants of all the questions. Um, the, what else? Long answer part will be the same. So you can either print it out or write out the answers. If you have a question where you have to write out the answers, um, do I know when the midterm is? I think it's the 23rd. Um, if you have to write out the answers, don't recopy out the whole question. Just put your answer down. I've seen, I know what the question is, so you don't have to, you know, take a lot of time to copy stuff down that way. Um, we're going to have multiple writing times for the midterm like last time, but the way we did it last time is we kind of had a main time at seven and then we had an early write that I think started at 530. And the early write was if you had a conflict and actually nobody in our section made use of the early write. Um, what, what I'm thinking this time is someone brought it up to me since then that the early time is actually a much better time for a lot of people because uh, the library is only open until seven. So the library is actually a great place to write it if you're in Wolfville because first of all, there's reliable internet there. Second of all, there's printers if you want to print out the written part before you scan and upload. So. Given that, I mean, you can decide for yourself which slot you want to be in. It's it's uh, not, not going to require, um, it's not going to be a big deal which one you pick. So these details will all come to you via email with instructions. Um, the upload thing to Gradescope will be just like last time, but we're going to add five minutes to the end to give you some tech time to make sure that you can upload it okay. And yeah, I would say that we are, or so far at least, have made no effort to make the midterm more difficult on account of it being open book. So it should look, I think, very much like the first one. The other one I find about midterm two, uh, I find midterm one has a lot of questions that are small and nitpicky in the sense, like it, it can be very difficult to get full marks on a lot of questions, especially, you know, it's easy to miss a charge somewhere or miss a pair of electrons or and there's lots of small topics I find where I find from here on in if there's like a couple of big concepts you either kind of get or you don't. So I guess there's a double edged sword there. I find it's many students find it easier to do well, like to get a higher score because there's fewer opportunities for little nitpicky things to go wrong. But on the other hand, it's also easier to go do really bad because if you don't know the work, it's hard to pick up part points in a lot of it. Although we do have multiple choice. And so, you know, multiple choice always can give you some free points if you're on that end of the scale. Um, but yeah, you're ready and good luck. Question? Uh, is this only, on six and seven? only on six and seven. However, uh, you still need to know how to do all the stuff from before. So, for example, if I gave you an SN2 question that inverted the configuration, 
I might say, draw the product of this SN2 reaction and indicate if the product is R or S. So in that case, yeah, chapter five is when we covered R and S, but I still expect that you can do R and S. Same thing, like obviously you still have to know how to draw resonance structures and Lewis structures. You still have to, um, you know, know your functional groups. There won't be questions, for example, on like infrared or carbon 13, because that was chapters two and four. Um, but the main skills that you learn along the way still have to be applied. Brooke asks, what chapter is the test cover? So yeah, six and seven, and we're only partway through seven at the moment. Okay. Cool. I'll talk more about this on Friday. We still have more class time. That said, let's get through seven so that we actually cover the material before the midterm comes. Uh, we already did the first 38 slides of chapter seven. And in this chapter, we were talking about alkenes. We talked about the difference between E and Z or cis and trans alkenes. We went through the, uh, I'm gonna turn off my email so those don't keep coming. Uh, we talked about how to identify if an alkene is E or Z using the CIP rules assigning priorities and things like that. Um, what else did we do? We looked at stability of alkenes, right? We said that an alkene, uh, not teams, I want, let's see. We talked about how an alkene can have one, two, three, four, up to four carbon groups attached, where if one of those four positions is carbon, we say it's a mono substituted, two of them are di, and dye comes in three types. There's trans dye, cis dye, and gem dye. Means both alkyl groups are on the same carbon. Uh, we also have tri, and then we have tetra. And as you add more alkyl groups, so we said tetra was the most stable, followed by tri, followed by di. Uh, however, we said the trans was the best, which was better than cis di, which was about the same as gem di, which is better than mono, which is more stable than unsubstituted. Okay. So this is important because we're going to be making alkenes and we're going to be looking at situations where more than one alkene might be possible as products. And in such cases, uh, the stability of the products is an important factor in deciding which one's going to be major. All right, so we're going to look at two reactions to make alkenes. Uh, we used to have three, but we cut one because it's not that useful. Um, so it's going to be preparation from alcohols which is a reaction called dehydration. And the name here is actually a very good descriptor of what's going on in the reaction. We're gonna lose a molecule of water, and it dehydrate it, it's gonna lose water. The other one is called preparation from alkyl halides, dehydrohalogenation. So you're gonna lose a hydrogen and a halogen, dehydrohalogenation, uh, and that makes an alkene as well. Both of these are elimination reactions. And we have already seen in the previous chapter, two mechanisms that we can use to do elimination, which are E1 and E2. E1 is the one that makes the carbocation first, leaving group leaves. Then the second step is something comes in as a base and removes a beta hydrogen to make your double bond. E2, everything happens at once, single step, bimolecular. So we're gonna start out by looking at the reaction of dehydration of alcohols. So here's going to be an example of the reaction. Here we have an alcohol. And what kind of alcohol is this? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Tertiary, that's good. How do you know? One alpha, three beta carbons. Three betas means it's tertiary. We're going to treat this with sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid. These are both strong acids. Well, sulfuric acid is definitely a strong acid. Phosphoric acid is, is kind of strong. It's kind of 
borderline, I guess we would say, between the strong and the weak acids, but it's still strong enough. It's pretty strong, we'll say. And what happens here is these reactions cause a water molecule to be removed from the molecule, which leaves behind a double bond. So we want to understand why this happens, what's going on in this reaction, and how can we predict what the products are going to be for a reaction like this. Okay. As an example, in this case, you know, you removed a beta hydrogen and an OH to make a molecule of water, but there's three beta carbons. So I drew that product, but could I not instead have drawn that product? Right? Could I have removed a hydrogen from a different beta carbon? And why did I choose the one that's here? So we're going to look at all of these factors and we're going to understand this based on the reaction mechanism. Just like we've seen in the previous chapter, we're going to be very interested in how the mechanism takes place here. All right, so exactly what happened here is we lose the OH and the hydrogen off of beta carbon and you get a mo water molecule and the double bond. OK, in terms of mechanism, one thing that we know is that as the alcohol becomes more substituted, primary, secondary, tertiary, as the substitution on that alcohol increases, the reaction gets faster. So remember SN2, the reaction got slower as we made it bulkier because it was harder for the nucleophile to attack. So that's maybe not the same. This is a, obviously not an SN2. SN2 doesn't make alkenes anyway. But we also saw a reaction like SN1 and E1. It got faster as you made it more substituted because you were making a carbocation. So this might suggest we're going to be making a carbocation as well. So here's what happens. You have an alcohol and you have your strong acid Here's something to think about. Anytime you see a reaction where in the first step you've added a very strong acid or a very strong base, the first step is likely going to involve that strong acid or strong base. Just like in the previous chapter when we did eliminations with alkoxides, alkoxides are strong bases, they do an E2. They react in the first step. They pull off the hydrogen. Now we're using a strong acid like sulfuric acid and what's happening here is the first step is a proton transfer. The strong acid will deliver a proton, donate a proton, molecule itself. So the molecule, the alcohol here, is acting like a base. It's accepting the proton from the strong acid. Alcohols are not particularly strong bases, but they're weaker uh, sorry, they're, they can still accept from a very strong acid, like sulfuric acid. And an if I gave you this first step in chapter two, and I said, which side, uh, if this is an equilibrium, which side of the equilibrium is favored? Remember those questions? Uh, nobody likes those questions. We ask them anyway. Because it comes back, right? You, you get to this chapter and you're like, oh, look, an acid base reaction again. Um, well, what you would do is you'd look at the acid on each side, this acid versus this acid, and identify which acid is stronger. And whichever side is stronger, the other side is going to be favored. It favors the side of the weak acid and the weak base. Well, it turns out that I think sulfuric acid has a pKa around negative three. And this alkoxide thing, sorry, oxonium ion is what this is called. Uh, see, it's written right there, has a pK of around minus 1.5. So that means the stronger acid is on the left. That means this is going to favor the stuff on the right. OK, so this is what happens with the strong acid in. It delivers a proton to the alcohol. Notice the blue arrows, how they're drawn. You draw it in the direction of electron flow, not in the direction of atom flow. And we have our oxonium ion. The oxonium ion um, is an intermediate in this reaction. So 
you can see I've drawn out the full Lewis structure there for sulfuric acid. If you want, you can just put H3O plus drawn here. Um, H3O plus, it's sort of like a shorthand version of sulfuric acid, especially this reaction is going to create H3O plus. So There's going to be H3O plus in solution as well. So either way, draw the acid out either as sulfuric acid or as H3O plus. And you have your oxonium. That's the first step. Oxonium ions can then lose water as a leaving group. So that's what's being shown here. This is a, a second step. Water is just leaving, going off on its own and making a carbocation. What kind of carbocation is this? Methyl primary, secondary, tertiary. Good, secondary. Um, secondary are, I mean, no carbocation is super stable. Tertiary is the best though, if you have to make them. Tertiary is the best. Secondary, a little bit worse than tertiary, but still doable. If you go primary or methyl though, those are terrible. You can't make primary or methyl carbocations. Too unstable. Carbocation formation is always the rate determining step for every mechanism you will see in this course. This reaction creates a carbocation, therefore this step will be the rate determining step. This step is unimolecular, first order. Only one molecule is involved, breaks into two pieces. So we would say that this mechanism is a unimolecular mechanism. So guess what we're going to call this? It's an elimination and it's unimolecular. We've seen this before, right? We've seen E1. E1 is not just for alkyl halides. E1 is for alcohols too. Problem with alcohols though is that OH- is a really bad leaving group. Remember for alkyl halides, we wouldn't use fluoride as a leaving group. Fluoride minus, we said was just too bad of a leaving group. Same thing with alcohols. Hydroxide is just too bad of a leaving group. But if you protonate it first with a strong acid, then it becomes a fantastic leaving group. H OH2 plus, you know what we have here, that's a great leaving group because it leaves as a nice, small, stable, neutral molecule water. Leaves behind that carbocation. Um, okay. So I, I don't want to get, get too ahead of myself on that slide because we're coming to that later. But we now have our carbocation. We now have two beta carbons, each with three hydrogens. A base needs to come along and take those one of those hydrogens as our next step. So what are we going to use as a base in this case? We're not going to use sulfuric acid. It's not a base. It's a strong acid. Phosphoric acid, same thing. We did just, though, in the previous step, eliminate a molecule of water. So that water molecule is made and produced and is nearby. Why don't we just use that as our base? So that water molecule is going to come along. It's going to pluck off one of the beta hydrogens. Like you see here, the electron pair that's in the CH bond, that electron pair comes down to make our double bond here. So this reaction is two steps, and it's very similar to the one we've already seen, E1, for alcohol halides. Protonate the alcohol first to make it a good leaving group, then it leaves, makes a carbocation, and a base comes and removes one of the beta hydrogens. It produced a molecule of H3O+. That's a product, but also we used a molecule of acid in the first step. So acid was used in the first step and then regenerated in the last step. That's what we call a catalyst. Something that participates in a reaction, is used in an early step, and then regenerated in a later step. Okay, so we say that this reaction is acid catalyzed. So the acid is not consumed. It's, it's spit back out in the last step. So this overall reaction, we would say, is the acid catalyzed dehydration of an alcohol. It goes by an E1 mechanism. In this example, or the alcohol was secondary. 
We already know how to label carbons. We've been doing it all semester. Um, check this one out for a second. That carbocation, unusual one, um, doesn't have any beta hydrogens. It's got three beta carbons. So what's it going to do? Well, it's not going to do dehydration. In fact, you can make cations that can't do the next step, like this one, and they're often stable, semi-stable. Like you could put the alcohol in strong acid and let them sit, and the, the OH will come off and make the carbocation. The carbocation can't do anything else because there's nothing for it to do. So it just sits there. And then so you can make solutions of carbocations and then study them if you want to learn some more about the carbocation themselves. All right, so it makes sense based on this mechanism why the fastest reaction should be tertiary because it makes the most stable carbocation and carbocation formation is the rate determining step. So that step will get faster the more substituted the alcohol is. So tertiary is best, secondary, second best, primary is the worst. However, Primaries still work. This reaction still happens for primaries, even though you can't make a primary carbocation. So that mechanism, great if you're tertiary or secondary, but if you're primary, that's not that's going to be a no-go. So it turns out for primary, there's another mechanism. Just like we saw for alkyl halides, it could be E1 or E2. Same for alcohols, it could be E1 or E2. So for the E1, the potential energy diagram looks like this. The first step has a small barrier. That's the proton transfer step. Small barrier means fast, okay? Uh, um, it makes the oxonium cation, which is an intermediate. It then goes through the rate determining step to make a carbocation, which is also an intermediate. And then that reacts to the base to make this plus H3O plus. So we have acid at the start, acid at the end. So that's the catalyst. And you know this is the rate determining step because it has the highest barrier out of the three steps. Remember that uh, first year? K equals what? A E to the minus E A over R T. That's, that's a good good equation. Top 10 equation in chemistry. You guys probably know most of the top 10 equations in chemistry. Another top 10 would be delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. I put that in the top 10. How about... Uh, um, Delta G equals minus RT ln K. Top 10 as well. Great equations to know if you're a chemist and if you're not a chemist. Uh, anyway, this one here just says that the rate constant is a function of the activation energy. The activation energy is large, the rate constant is small, slow. All right, back to these primary ones that we said work anyway, even if you don't have, if, even if you can't make a carbocation. Well, the first step, the fast step, the proton transfer step, doesn't care if you can make a carbocation or not. It's not looking ahead. Uh, so what happens is just the same as the previous step. There's a proton transfer if you have a primary alcohol from the acid to the alcohol, just like before, to make an oxonium. The difference now is you can't drop that water molecule off. You can't make that carbocation because it's not stable enough. Still has an alpha carbon, it still has a beta. The beta still has two hydrogens. So, what happens if you can't make the carbocation, which is the case in a primary, then the water um, that could be just around, maybe eliminated from a previous molecule or as an impurity in your sulfuric acid, it can come remove one of the beta hydrogens simultaneous with that hydrogen being removed, the CH electrons here, 
move down to make a double bond. That arrow, that blue arrow is not great. It should go to the bond, not to the atom. And the electrons in this bond move up onto the oxygen. So all in one step, you regenerate your acid that you used up in the first step. You have your alkene and you have your water molecule. This is just E2. This is the same, exact same mechanism we drew for alkyl halides for E2, except there's the proton transfer step at the beginning. Okay, other than that, everything happens the same. One step, bimolecular, the water and the oxonium come together, rate determining step. All these steps happen at once, all in sequence, not at all in sequence, all together. The word we use to describe a reaction like this is concerted. Concerted means all bonds form and break together at the same time. So this is a, a great mechanism because you don't have to make a carbocation. Carbocations are, you know, if you can make a carbocation, that reaction is faster, which is why tertiary and secondary are faster than primary, but primaries can still go. What about methyl, do you think? What if you had methanol? that going to undergo dehydration? No, you can't dehydrate that because you don't have the beta carbon. Can't make a double bond. You can't make an alkene. You certainly can't make a carbocation. So yeah, we would say something like this would be no reaction. What makes this step bimolecular? It's a question I got from Lizzie. Uh, bimolecular because you have one and two things come together in a single step. It's bimolecular because two atoms or two molecules are reacting together. That's different from the E1 we had before. Where is our E1? E1, back, back. In this one, we have just a single thing which breaks apart in the rate determining step. So it's unimolecular. It's just one molecule that's reacting here. Uh, okay, potential energy diagram for E2 looks like this. There's two steps. There's the fast proton transfer step. And there's the slow E2, where everything else happens all at once. Okay, so the rate determining step is the step that's not the proton transfer step. But it's not forming a carbocation here because it's E2. Uh, up here is the transition state. The tops of every hump, top of every hill is a transition state. <clears throat> so for E2, the transition state might look like this, where you have this bond starting to form. Uh, you have this bond starting to break, this one starting to form, this one's starting to break. So all those bonding changes are happening simultaneously in E2. Okay, so with elimination reactions like dehydration, often what you can get is possibilities of getting more than one product because you make the carbocation in the first step for E1, then you have to remove a beta hydrogen. And when the base comes in, like the water molecule comes in, it has a choice over which beta hydrogen it selects. All of the examples I gave you in the previous chapter were carefully selected so that all beta hydrogens were identical. So it didn't matter which beta hydrogen you took. We're gonna look at cases that are a bit more complex than that. If you have an alcohol like this, we now, we have three beta carbons, but they're clearly not all equivalent. Right, there's the methyl, the CH3 ones, but there's also the CH2. They're not the same as each other. And when that removal of the beta hydrogen takes place, there's a big preference that it much rather would take the beta hydrogen from this carbon than from one of those carbons. So those CH3s, there's six beta hydrogen those six beta hydrogens, the removal of one of those only accounts for 10% of the product mix. There's only two, right? There's six there. There's two 
on, on the other carbon, right? There's it's a CH2. 90% of the time, one of those two goes. So clearly, how many of those beta hydrogen types there are is not what decides which one goes fastest. Otherwise, if it was just st statistical, you'd expect you know, a six to two ratio of products in favor of the second one. But no, it goes for the one where there's only two preferentially. It's selective. In fact, we have a word for this. We say it's regioselective. Regioselective means if a reaction can produce more than one constitutional isomer, sometimes we call them regioisomers, if it can produce more than one constitutional isomer, but it produces one of those in greater amount than the others, we say it's regioselective. So it's regioselective because it produces this one, the 90% one, in greater amount than the other one. It's not just statistical or random. Here's another example of the same thing. We have, in this case, a tertiary alkyl halide with sulfuric acid, which undergoes E1. We have our alpha, beta, beta, beta. It could either take a ring product, a ring beta, or it could take the methyl beta, and it can make A or B. It turns out it makes A in much greater amounts than B. So we would say hey, this one is major and that one's minor. So why? Why does this take place? If we go back to this example, why is that one 90% and the other one is 10%? And the reason goes back to something we did at the beginning of this chapter. In these kinds of reactions, there is a preference for to produce the alkene that's more stable. So in this case, this alkene is tri-substituted, right? If you look at the double bond, it has one, two, three alkyl groups on it. It's tri-substituted. The other product is di. It's got one, two carbon groups that are attached to the double bond. The other two are hydrogens. So tri is more stable than di. And no, this isn't just dye, this is gem dye, isn't it? So the tri is more stable, so the tri is the major product. So it's selective to produce the product that's more stable. And so this has a name, this, this preference for the more stable product. It's called Zaitsev's rule, which most books right like that. I think I've seen it also as like S-A-Y, SAIT, S-E-F-F -F or something like that. I don't know. But I'm going to write it like this, Zaitsev's rule. It's probably anglicized from the original Russian. Uh, the rule is very simple. If there's more than one product possible, the major product will be the one that's more or most stable. So A, we would predict as the major product because it's try in this case versus die in this case. So you have to be able to look at an alkene and assess, you know, what what the degree of substitution is for the alkene. Here's another one. This alcohol, um, it's secondary. Sulfuric acid will react and it will protonate the alcohol. The, the water comes off to make a carbocation. It can lose a beta hydrogen, but there's two possible products. You could make either the cis or the trans. These are not constitutional isomers. These are stereoisomers. What kind of stereoisomers are these? Diastereomers, good. Cis-trans pair. So these are stereoisomers. Um, Zaitsev's rule applies to these two. If you can make more than one stereoisomer, Zaitsev's rule says that you will make preferentially the, the stereoisomer that is more stable. And we know that trans is more stable than cis, right? This is trans di, cis di. 
Trans dye is more stable than cis dye because it has less van der Waals strain. So it'll produce trans here as the major product and cis as the minor product. So what we would say here is that this reaction is stereoselective as well. Stereoselective means if there's more than one stereoisomer po possible, but one is formed in greater amounts than the other. So it's stereoselective because you get more trans than cis. The exact ratio here would be extremely dependent on the temperature and things like that. And I'm never going to ask you to predict the actual ratios. Uh, just know that the trans is more stable than the one that's more stable will be produced in greater amounts. So let's say you wanted to make oleic acid in the lab. Oleic acid is the fatty acid that you find in olive oil. And let's say you happen to have this alcohol right here. And you put this molecule together. And as your last step, you want to do a dehydration to make your double bond. And now you have your synthetic oleic acid. Let's say olive trees go extinct and we need oleic acid for some reason. Do you think this step is any good? Any thoughts on if this is a good reaction to produce this molecule? No. Why? It's cis, right? So right away you're trying to make a cis, right? This is if you're making a double bond here, right? It's a bad reaction because the major product will be trans and the one we want is cis. So first of all, that's not good. The other problem is there's two beta carbons. The double bond can go on either side. So instead of the double bond being here, we could have put the double bond there as well between those two carbons. So there's two regioisomers possible. And for each of those regioisomers, there's a two different stereoisomers possible. So there's a total of four possible products here. And the one that we want is not going to be a major product. It's going to be a minor product because it's cis. So for that reason, this is not a very good reaction. And if you needed to produce this and you work for a chemical plant, uh, they would send you back to the drawing board to come up with a better way of making this. All right, now here's a, here's a weird case. Here's an alcohol, it's an alpha. We have a beta and a beta. So we're going to react with H2SO4. It's secondary, so it can make carbocations, so it's E1. Alcohol gets protonated, water leaves, you get your carbocation. That would be a secondary carbocation. You can lose a beta hydrogen on the left side to make A or lose a beta hydrogen on the carbon below it to make B. But what we also see is some C. Where does C come from? That doesn't make any sense, does it? But it's real and it's true and it's there and it's formed. So something funky is happening in this case to make C. It's not just you lose a beta hydrogen and you lose the OH group and make a double bond because the OH was at that position. So something has moved, things have shifted inside this molecule. Here's an even weirder one. Okay, here's another alcohol. This is a secondary. We have sulfuric acid. Um, this is a beta, that's a beta. The top beta doesn't have any hydrogen, so you can't eliminate up there, right? You can't make something that looks like that because there's no hydrogen there. You can't have uh, a pentavalent carbon like that, so that's no good. But you can go on the bottom one and see so you make A, and up till right now, you'd look at that and say, well, A is the only possible product. That should be 100%. It's 3% of your product mix. Instead, you get B and you get C. B is major at 64. C is, you know, 33%, not bad, not major, but not bad. And this A that we would have predicted at the beginning was our major product, 3%. 
barely there. You'd have to be watching close to even notice it was formed at all. Not only that, like the carbons aren't attached to the same atoms as they were before. We used to have this carbon with three methyls. Now that carbon has only two. That carbon only has two. And it looks like one of the methyls moved over to the other carbon. Like the thing rearranged. And this is something that happens anytime you have a reaction with carbocations. You can get these atoms scramble around like this. It's called a rearrangement and it's very predictable. And again, we showed you a whole chapter in chapter six of reactions with carbocations. Every single example was carefully chosen so that it wouldn't do this. Okay, and I'm going to show you how to look out, predict when these happen, and how to still arrive at the expected major product. <laughs> okay, so this first example, what's going on? You protonate the alcohol, water leaves, you make a secondary carbocation that's right here. This carbocation is secondary. So here's the first important piece of information at understanding these rearrangements. Secondary carbocations are the only ones that rearrange. If it's tertiary, you don't have to worry about it, move on with your life, complete the mechanism, and draw your products. If it's secondary, then we do have to worry about it. And why do we have to worry about it? Well, it turns out secondary carbocations aren't particularly stable. They're really high energy. They're going to do whatever they can do to become more stable. Primary, we don't have to worry about because we aren't going to be making primary carbocations. Secondary, um, so secondaries are the ones we have to keep our eye open for. Anytime you're drawing a mechanism and you're going through the steps and you see you've made a secondary carbocation, alarm bells should start going off in your heads. This is a secondary carbocation. Can this do a rearrangement? Well, a rearrangement will only happen if it turns a carbocation into a tertiary carbocation. So a secondary won't rearrange to a different secondary. There's no, no good in that. It doesn't bring it down in energy. But it will if it can go to a tertiary. So what's going on here? There's a hydrogen there. Is the hydrogen still there? What's happening is the hydrogen on a beta carbon just slides over. It trades places with the cation. It looks like this. If you were to draw the curly arrow, it starts at that CH bond. The hydrogen with its pair of electrons just shifts over one space. So the hydrogen is now here, and the cation has taken the place where the hydrogen was. So this is a good rearrangement because it turned a secondary into a tertiary. So then what happens is the re main reaction happens from this now rearranged carbocation. So over here, A, if the carbocation was here, A would be the major product. C can also come from the rearranged carbocation now, but B, came from the original carbocation. This is called a hydride shift. Hydride because the thing that shifted was a hydrogen plus a pair of electrons. And this, the negative charge, is called a hydride. Um, so it's a hydrogen with two electrons that have, have uh, shifted over. And you see the curly arrow I used here. There's actually um, some textbooks use a fancier curly arrow to show a rearrangement, which I can redraw down here. You can use whichever one you like. Some of them use a loopy curved arrow. So it's like a curly arrow, but has just a little loop in it somewhere. And if you have a little loop in it, it just means an atom and the pair of electrons are going. You don't have to do that. You can just do it the way I have it up here. But if you want it to be fancy, loopy curly arrow. I don't know if it's called a loopy curly arrow, but anyway, you can do that if you want. Um, now about this one? Where do these come from? I'm going to do this one on the whiteboard because 
if I want to. I can do what I want. By the way, this is a chiral molecule, isn't it? It's chiral center there. Um, we have sulfuric acid. I'm going to abbreviate like this. We have strong acid and we have our alcohol. Strong acid, first step, whenever you see a strong acid, you should think proton transfer. Proton transfer will happen like that. This now has two hydrogens, a positive charge, and we have a molecule of water. We don't want to forget about that water molecule because we're going to use that later on to pull off a beta hydrogen. Uh, now, we have to make our carbocation because this is secondary. That breaks off. This is a unimolecular reaction. And what you get is carbocation. There's a hydrogen on that, right? Hydrogen there. So we're just going through the normal steps. Protonate, make a carbocation. Secondary. Uh oh. Secondary carbocation alarms start going off. Okay. Can we do a rearrangement here to make a tertiary carbocation? So this is what you got to look for. When you're at this stage and those alarm bells are going off, those alarm bells are no good if they don't give you a path. If, if there's nothing you, you can do. So we have alpha, we have beta, and we have beta. This beta has three hydrogens. This beta, the other beta has three methyls. So what we would like to do is slide something over to the positive charge and then switch places with the charge and the group that slides over. Well, what you can see on the right side is those three hydrogens can we do a hydride shift? I'll do a fancy curly, curly curved arrow, a curly, curly arrow. Well, what would that do for us? That would give us, and now I guess I'm gonna put red in here so it's clear which ones are from the previous step and positive charges there. Was that a good rearrangement? That's awful. It made a primary. Can't make primary carbocations. So this is no good. OK, let's get rid of that. It's not what we're going to do. Instead, what we're going to do is look to the other beta carbon. And there's no hydrogens we can slide over. We can't do a, a hydride shift. But we can slide a methyl over. So if we take a methyl, we can take a whole alkyl group and pull the whole alkyl group over. If we do something like that, it leaves two behind. It's got a methyl there now and a hydrogen, and then it's got this one with the three reds, I guess. Put them back. Uh, so that moved the methyl over to the middle carbon, and it put the positive charge over on the left side. This is a tertiary carbocation, and I'm going to just simplify that. Looks like this. So this is a good rearrangement because it turned a secondary into a tertiary, and that would be called an alkyl shift. So the things that can shift are hydrides and alkyl groups. Once we're here, we have the alpha, beta, 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 you can lose the major product is going to have our water molecule from before. Come back in. Remove that beta hydrogen and make that as our major product. Or it could remove a hydrogen from one of those betas and make this. 
as a minor product. And we know this is minor because this is gem dye. And this one is tetra. And tetra is more stable than gem dye. All right, we're out of time, but we're going to come back to this. This is a, I find students often find this a lot to swallow all at once. You're only sort of starting to get comfortable with the whole concept of E1, E2, SN1, SN2. Now we're throwing a big wrench in there like, oh yeah, by the way, if it's tertiary or if it's secondary a carbocation, this rearrangement is something else now you have to look out for. So these are all these different steps that you have to be wary of when you're doing these reactions. OK, thank you very much. Um, we'll pick up on Friday do the best we can here. And you guys have a great week, day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. So yes, certainly, okay. and there'll be emails with the. I don't have like exact times yeah. or anything like that no, from I was yet. Just wondering if they're like going to be. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys prefer like the live tutorials like last time or yeah. the video ones? I like the live ones. I feel like when there's a video, I just end up trying to fix it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um. Okay. So when we're tutorial, if it's live or the beginning, we just look at the list of the steps and it's clear to Mm-hmm. Because in the first one, when it was C1, technically the first step is it looks like it could be bimolecular because there's two molecules working together, but then that's not creating the carbocation. Right. It's bimolecular, but that's not the rate determining yeah. step. Okay. So, so another way to think about it, if there's a carbocation, it's always unimolecular. Okay. If there's no carbocation, it's always bimolecular. Okay. For these reactions. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then. Uh, what other questions did I have? Um, okay, so this one, how did you get, so did you move this hydrogen all the way over to this side because that's where the okay, formal charge is? my mask on here oh, yeah, so right. I can get close to you here. All right, let me just take a peek at what you got. So this was the last example that we just did. Alright, so this one was the gen dye, but did you bring this hydrogen over to this side? And no. Nope. So all I did there, let me draw that. Positive charge. This is a, a oh. beta. This is a beta. And this is a beta. Right. So when your base comes in, it can remove that one. Yeah. Or they can take one of those. Okay. And so, so this would be the same as that? Yes. Okay. Because you can rotate that around. Okay. So if you take one of those six, yes. you get this. Okay. If you take that single one there, you get this. Okay. I just need that a hydrogen. That helps big time. <laughs> yeah. It works out too if you, um, this one is still going to be the major one. Yeah. Because it's not determined by how many hydrogens you have. Right. It's just. In fact, I guess arguably the fewer the hydrogens there are, the more likely it is to be major. Okay. That usually will give you the more substituted product. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And then, sorry, I just have to class, no, no. so. Totally fine. Um, okay. This, I wrote it down, so I take notes on the presentation, and I wrote it down, I have no idea what it meant. So we're talking about like the cycloalkanes. Um, and it was talking about like the if it's cis or trans and whether or not it was stable or unstable mm -hmm. in cis or trans. Can you kind of maybe explain it so it's not just written and like kind of more drawn out again? Sure, I do it right here. Yeah, go for it. So we talked about how if you have a, an alkene that's not in a ring, that that is more stable than like right. 
because that has the bigger wall screen. Yeah. But in a ring, um, that one is six, right? Yeah. You can imagine that being trans into three, four, five, six, seven, um, right? Because you could have like you need a trans one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Like you it can. It just looks. Yeah, you can tell right away, like, trans is, is better if it's in a straight, but right. cis is better if it's in a ring. Okay. Because and anytime it's in a ring, it's cis is better? Yeah. Okay. Unless so if it's like, like, a, there's like, if it's over 11 carbons or something like that, then it's not. Yeah, and like, okay. you can make rings that are like 12 carbons, and there's probably examples at that size where yeah. it doesn't make a big difference. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. For any okay. ring size you'll see in this class, like eight would be like the max it would go. Okay. Um, big rings are very rare in biology, like, okay. and for there's not a good reason to make them for anything either. Yeah. Um, sometimes you see eight, sometimes you see seven. Rarely, like sometimes you see in biology like huge rings, like 50. Right. But. Um, and there's just less van der Waals strain if it's on there. If it's trans, because there's a bigger bond angle. Like in trans, yeah, like trans, because this group and this group are far away. There's yeah. low band of walls. Yeah. And sure, in this ring too, like this and this are far away. So there's low band of wall strain between those two groups. Right. You got like crazy bad angle strain okay. in there. Oh, okay. So like, yeah, you save a little bit of band of wall strain, but you pay for it in like huge angle strain. Okay. Cool. Feeling good about it so far? Um, yeah. We'll see. Okay. Simply, because there was only two midterms, two midterms on the site, like for practice. There's like midterm one and midterm two. Yeah. Like all those. So, should I go?